So our next speaker is uh, here from Spotify, James McInery, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, uh, talking talk to us about explore, exploit, and explain, personalizing explainable recommendations with bandits. Uh, good morning. I'm delighted to be at Rexus again. Um, this is work, uh, joint work with Ben Lacker, Samantha Hansen, Carl Higley, Ugg Bouchard, Halloise Grusson, and Richard Marotra. Um, so I want to start off with the research question before um, sort of st taking a step back to the motivation. So the research question that we wanted to answer was um, how to do exploration, exploitation over explainable recommendations. That's kind of a mouthful. Um, so I'll hopefully explain what I mean by, by those terms during the course of the, this very short talk. Um, so what I want to have in, uh, in the back of your mind as an example is something like the homepage of Spotify. But um, if you look out in the lobby, I'm sure you'll find many other examples um, of other recommenders that will uh, give you a set of items that exist on a shelf, and each shelf will have a title um, that kind of gives a bit of context, a bit of explanation around uh, the item you're being recommended. And so the, the question we, we want to know is, um, can we do uh, kind of bandit-based approaches um, over this uh, setting? So the outline for the talk is, I'm going to start off by identifying um, some interesting trends in uh, whenever you have content producers interacting with consumers. Um, I'll drill down into recommendation as a specific example of that. Then I'll bring in the motivation for contextual bandits in this setting and explained recommendations. And I'll outline our solution, which is called BART, Bandits for Recommendations as Treatments. And then I'll describe some experiments. So um, whenever you have producers interacting with consumers, you have this kind of rich get richer phenomenon. So if you think a musician, an author, or an actor, um, their popularity at time t will be influencing uh, their exposure to new consumers, uh, either by word of mouth, media coverage. Um, hands up who heard Beyonce from the hotel room last night. OK. And the other two thirds of the audience has no idea what I'm talking about. But there's a, there's a gigantic uh, stadium, in, the, in case you didn't notice. Um, and so you can think of Beyonce. Of course, she's, she's very talented. She puts on a great show. But um, her exposure is also tied to her popularity. And you wouldn't necessarily be exposed to the, um, the amazing singer-songwriter playing at a, a dive bar on the other side of Vancouver. So that's what I mean by that. So this is also known as the Matthew effect or the Pareto principle. And the way this uh, pans out in recommendation is, is very interesting. So um, let me just set it up by uh, saying that I'm going to be referring to uh, a user preference model as a model that predicts relevance or engagement for a particular item, like a playlist. Um, and the goal of the preference model is to, yeah, to pr predict that. So you can think of many examples like matrix factorization, uh, factorization machines, which is, which is an extension of matrix factorization that will capture uh, lots of sign information for you. Um, you could also have more, more complex examples like deep learning or something that's cobbled together with uh, word to vec But at a very high level, we have this preference model that tries to predict why the relevance, given A, the recommendation, uh, and X, the context. The context will contain all the information we have about a user and an item or anything relevant to the uh, predicted relevance. It will go into this uh, single vector that I'll refer to as X. And then finally, we have the model itself that we're interested in training via a set of parameters. OK, so around this preference model, we have a pipeline that typically looks like this. So I think across industry, you'll see something very similar to this. Um, so we take a set of feedback data from the past. We train our model. And then we, that model is determining what gets recommended to consumers or to users or listeners. And then at time t plus 1, this feedback is fed back into the database, and we train the model again. And so um, there are some interesting problems with that that have been articulated very well in recent years. Um, for example, Alison Cheney is actually presenting a paper in this conference, I, I believe, on um, this uh, filter bubble phenomenon. Um, it also goes back to this notion of exposure, or not missing at random, uh, from Darwin Liang. And uh, obviously, it goes back much further, the, the general phenomenon of not missing at random. And so the question we want to ask is, can we apply a corrective that will uh, correct for this problem? 
And it helps to introduce at this point the concept of uncertainty. So regardless of whether our model is explicitly capturing uncertainty, we can say that our, our model will be certain or uncertain based on the available data. So when the model is uh, very certain, then uh, so the, the, the rows in this uh, diagram are the kind of ground truth relevance of an item to a user, and the columns are the model certainty. So when the model is very certain, then it's kind of obvious what we want to do. If the item is really relevant, then uh, we want to exploit it. We want to recommend it to a user. Otherwise, let's just you know, keep it back um, and, and not recommend it. So the problem comes when uh, there's uh, less certainty around the relevance. So in less certainty, it turns out that sometimes a model will uh, ignore an item that, it, that is uh, relevant to a user, and sometimes it will exploit an item that is not relevant to a user. And it's really this low left quadrant that, that's the problematic one. And I'll give you an example of, of how this happens. So imagine we had two items that both had the same predicted, the same ground truth relevance, 10%, which means that 10% of the time that we show an item to a user, um, they'll click it, or they'll stream it, or they'll save it. Let's go and uh, collect some data to try and estimate what this ground truth uh, rate is gonna be. So we go out and we, we get 10 impressions for each item. Um, so it's actually very easy for uh, one item, let's say item B, to have a much higher uh, predicted click rate than item A. Um, so in this example, uh, item A would, would have an estimated rate of zero, and item B would uh, be at least uh, uh, 10%. Um, and this results in the recommender ignoring the uh, item that, that is uh, being classified as, as uh, having a zero rate. And it turns out that, that this is fairly, you know, this, this can happen quite often. So in this uh, kind of cartoon example I've constructed, you'll get it wrong two thirds of the time. So let's take a step back. And um, so let's uh, start with the ideal of a randomized control trial. So um, in a randomized control trial, uh, let's say you have a new medication that you want to, to test out. You'll compare it to uh, either a placebo or some other uh, uh, medication, and you'll randomly assign the, the medication based on uh, no information at all, just uniform random uh, assignment. And uh, th this works because it, uh, so in sort of the, the causality literature, you would say it uh, blocks the backdoor path between the treatment and the effect. Um, but if that doesn't make sense to you, just, just uh, remember that most of the medication in your or cabinet will have come from a randomized controlled trial. Mm -hmm. So we can do something similar here. Let's just um, recommend some random stuff and collect data. And the preference model we train on this will be the right thing. And what I mean by the right thing uh, this is not to burden you with complexity, but to just say that we can summarize this whole, this ideal pipeline is, as one uh, ideal expectation that says, let's uh, choose a model that you like and train on the data however you like to train it, for example, gradient descent. And the outer part is to say, let's train on the right data. So in this case, it's a randomized controlled trial. And just to remind you, A is gonna be the action, uh, and A squiggle is the set of all items and we're interested in training model parameters theta. So this is now our new objective under the ideal circumstance. But obviously we don't want to recommend random stuff all the time, which motivates exploration exploitation. So in this left-hand column that I showed you earlier, we're now gonna say we're gonna explore in order to gather more data. Um, and this really addresses this uh, problem of, uh, okay, so we don't want to show users random stuff all the time. So we're gonna, most of the time, we're gonna show uh, relevant stuff, and some of the time, we're gonna show um, uh, sort of exploratory items. And obviously, there's more uh, complex ways of doing this, but uh, we start with an initial uh, simpler approach called Epsilon Greedy. That's worth looking into if, if you're interested in this, uh, in this field. And Epsilon Greedy says, let's just put most of the probability mass. So um, I don't have a laser pointer, but I'll describe with words. Uh, the best action, A star, as predicted by the user preference model, will get most of the probability mass, and then we'll, we'll have a small chance of choosing other actions. Okay, so it turns out we can approximate this using uh, some deploy policy pi, using this approach called um, inverse propensity scoring. And this enables uh, counterfactual evaluation and model training, um, and usually used in conjunction with uh, variance reduction techniques. Uh, so Thorsten Yakims, uh, among others, has very good work on, on this particular area. Okay, so, so this is now our, our corrected pipeline. 
uh, that's taking into account the, the deployed uh, policy. And back to this research question, so what we set out to answer is um, how to do exploration and exploitation over this set of shelves. And I'll just mention that these shelves have been um, designed by, by humans, but will have uh, some algorithmic um, set of uh, rules that will decide uh, which cards uh, can appear on which shelves in a personalized manner. Um, so this gives us a notion of uh, safe exploration. Um, so naively, the bandit has to try every possible combination of item and explanation many times before being able to exploit the best combinations. So part of our contribution is, is to describe um, how we can actually explore over this joint space of items and explanations. And so our solution is called BART, and I encourage you to read the paper for more details of, of how this works, but it consists of a user preference model of your choice, a ranking procedure, um, and uh, propensities. So uh, I think I will just uh, get onto the experiments. So um, when we use uh, a model that, that has been trained on uh, this explore exploit method, we get um, significant improvements over just random selection um, or even just a first order model that will predict popularity. Um, so let me just get to the last slide because I'm getting to my 10 minutes. So, oh, sorry? You're past your 10 minutes. I'm past my 10 minutes. <laughs> so um, there's many extensions, so uh, I think more elaborate uh, preference models would, um, would capture uh, more nuanced uh, uh, interactions in the data. Also, the ranking model is not defined to promote diversity of items. It's, it's a very independent ranking model. And um, also, I mentioned we, we're doing exploration over a, a candidate set, a sort of safe exploration. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm just giving you a taste of this work. So please see the poster during the lunch down, right down the end of the hall. You can also visit the Spotify recruiting booth. Um, we're looking for scientists, engineers, interns. Um, you can catch up with me or another Spotify during the conference. We'll be around. Uh, email or tweet. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll be interested to hear questions. Any questions? I'm quite happy to, to grab this one. I think bandits are a very interesting way forward, especially when we're looking at streaming data and things that are passing by quickly. So you look at the probabilities and that helps you part of the way. Uh, but there was a particular comment that caught my attention. Um, so you were saying collaborative filtering can only exploit or ignore. And what we've seen with re-ranking approaches and playing around with different feature sets and different definitions of context, I think has moved the boundary uh, of what we actually can do with collaborative filtering there. And I think that that space of playing with features can also be done with bandits. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in terms of effectively feature engineering there. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, thanks for the good question. Um, so uh, I think whenever you have a model that is seeing finite data, uh, you're, you're potentially vulnerable to this either exploit or ignore problem. Um, and so it, what we're trying to say is it really helps to explicitly explore because you're being upfront around the uncertainty around the data. Um, I think applying like bandits to, to re-ranking is, is a very interesting research area, um, and it's something that I would list as sort of follow-up work to, to Bart. Hello. I have a quick question about the results, which you didn't have time to go into, uh, but I was reading in the paper, I mean, how well does this work? Uh, you're comparing against two baselines. One of them is a logistic regression, and uh, it works better than logistic regression, right? But uh, do you have a sense of, like, um, how much of the gains that you're measuring, even in, on the A-B test, are due to the tweaking and the optimization that you did for your particular situation versus like how general is this? Yeah, thanks. Um, so a few things about that. So first of all, the logistic regression is being used in conjunction with the bandits. So um, that plot was really about um, how, how, how much does the user preference model influence the, the quality of results. Um, so really the, the, the comparison baseline uh, we, we were interested in is, okay, so, um, so previously we would have um, sort of a more static version of the homepage. So can we 
outdo the static version with a more uh, reactive model, like a, like a bandits model. Um, so, and it does significantly better, like really does a lot better. And it's getting better over time as we add more and more features and, and uh, you know, search this model space for better preference models. So the comparison is against the status quo of what you had in production at that point, which was a static without the exploration component. That's right, yeah. But okay. um, so static, but still personalized. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We also compared to random, and you know, reassuringly, static does better than random. So I'm afraid your... we've run out of time for questions again. Oh. But please do have a chat with James because it's a very nice presentation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank, the, thank the speaker again. Yeah.